The reading this morning is from Malachi, chapter 2, starting at verse 17 and going through to chapter 3, verse 6. It's on page 850 of the Black Bibles. So that's Malachi, chapter 2, 17 through to 3, verse 6. You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you ask, how have we wearied him? When you say, everyone who does what is evil is good in the Lord's sight, and he is delighted with them, or else, where is the God of justice? See, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. Then the Lord you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant you delight in. See, he is coming, says the Lord of armies. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who will be able to stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire and like launderer's bleach. He will be like a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. Then they will, be, then they will present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will please the Lord as in days of old and years gone by. I will come to you in judgment, and I will be ready to witness against sorcerers and adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker, the widow, and the fatherless, and against those who deny justice to the resident alien. They do not fear me, says the Lord of armies, because I, the Lord, have not changed. You, descendants of Jacob, have not been destroyed. This is the word of the Lord. Oh, you want to keep that open though? Eight, page 850. I think it's 850. It's always out by one, isn't it? Just to... Chris isn't here to remind me. He would usually shout out the exact number. Um, there are... Look, there are some... Let's start with this. Um, we're going to talk today about the justice of God and the presence of evil. And there is a survey. There was a survey done in 2011 called the Australian Communities Report. And it was a survey done um, on people's attitudes to religion, to Christianity, to, to spiritual life um, in the general Australian community, hence the Australian Community's report. And in the report, it had the top five things that were blockages or belief blockers, I suppose you'd call it, to spiritual life, to Christianity, to God. And number three on that list was the presence of suffering or evil it was a major block for people to come to God and to come to terms with God and the reality of God this was in a, as I said in a survey in 2011 um, this was this is not a new argument the idea about all the, the presence of evil and the, the problem in the fourth century BC Epicurus put it this way uh, he said it, God is either on the one hand he's either willing to get rid of suffering, but he's not able. Like he's impotent in some way. He can, either, he can either do it, he's willing, but he's not able. Or he's able, he's powerful enough to get rid of suffering, but he's not willing. He's detached and uncaring. And this, is, this argument is put forth because there is the presence of evil. We look around the world and we see that there is trouble in the world. We, of course, experience this. We might even see that the evil people prosper. People have no problems exploiting the poor. There are people who cheat, who cut corners, people without integrity, and sometimes they seem to win. <laughs> and then on the other hand, you've got the righteous, some that are self-sacrificing, perhaps people you know that um, they tend to get, they might get walked all over though, and it doesn't seem like, it doesn't seem like God's righteousness works. Um, on the one hand, God is, there is evil, there's suffering that we experience, that we know about this, we see this. So either God is willing but not able, or able but not willing. And to put it in a modern day frame, we might just say something simply like this How can I believe in a God that allows suffering? And maybe we've experienced this or felt this. 
And of course, this isn't just an academic question. We may have experienced suffering or be going through some. And we ask this, you know, how could God allow, allow something to happen to me? How could he allow this particular thing to happen to me? Or people that we know who are good people who have gone through terrible things. There are some people we know, they might try to live good lives and be good people, and we think, how could God allow that? It's not just an academic thing, is it? This is a reality that we all live with. And the Israelites asked this question. Have a look at verse 17. It's the very first verse we had in the reading. Everyone, chapter 2, verse 17, everyone who does what is evil is good in the Lord's sight, and he is delighted with them. Where is the God of justice? This is what they're saying. They're saying, everyone who does evil is good in the Lord's sight. He seems to be delighted in them. Where is the God of justice? It's that exact question. It's that, that issue. Where is God? Or at least, where is the God of justice? You notice that it's an important thing. Where is the God of right and wrong and the God of who will not allow evil to prosper. And the thing is, we have to... This is the Christian response. We're going to look at this in, the, in a moment. The Christian's response to suffering or evil. And especially we're going to tinge it with Christmas coming. Um, Christmas, the Christian response. The thing is, though, we have to come... We all have to deal with suffering, don't we? We all have to live with the philosophy of suffering. So if we don't have a Christian response to suffering, we've still got to live with it. We've still got to somehow somehow have some way of living, right? The atheist thinks, I mean, essentially says that there's no right or wrong, is there? There's no evil, there's no bad, it's just, it just is. We have to have some sort of philosophy to cope with this, to deal with it, to talk about it, to make sense of it. I suppose I'm just saying either way, you've got to come up with some way of living with this. I think the Christian story has the best response to suffering. And I want to show you three things, in particular connected to Christmas and the Incarnation. I'll kind of give you a Christmas sermon before Christmas. Um, you can hear another one on Christmas Day. But I want to give you three things about how why Christmas is God's response to suffering. The first is um, in verse 1. And it's all in the passage as well. So the first is the God of the Bible is the God who refuses to stay away from evil. The God we worship is the one who refuses to stay away from evil. Have a look at verse 1. See, I'm going to send my messenger and he will clear the way before me. Then the Lord you seek will suddenly come to his temple and the messenger of the covenant you delight in. This is that, that verse, you know, that's in the, in the New Testament with John the Baptist. See, I'm going to send my messenger. He's going to clear the way before you. And then after that, what happens? It says, then the Lord you seek will come suddenly in the temple. He'll turn up. And the messenger of the covenant you delight in. What's it talking about? It's talking about God turning up in history. It's called, talking about incarnation. It's talking about God with us. And the point is that Christmas... It tells us we have a God, we worship a God who is honest enough to get involved in suffering himself. He enters into the world. God with us. We don't worship a God who is distant or detached. Because it says there, the Lord will seek, he suddenly come to his temple and the messenger, notice the messenger of the covenant, you delight in the covenant, they delight in covenant, the law, the right and the wrong. The one who gives the covenant and who says this is the law, this is right and wrong, he's the one that turns up in flesh. It's the promise of the day when God enters the world. And if Christmas is true and the baby is born, it's the God of the universe, the God of the covenant, who takes on flesh. And the beauty of it is that we have a God, we worship a God who is honest enough to get involved in the suffering himself. He will not stay away from suffering. And this is absolutely unique in terms of philosophies in, in, in the world. You understand? There's no other philosophy or ism that comes into contact where God comes into contact with humanity 
And it means God knows us. He knows what suffering, what he's like. Even more, he's come in and he's entered in. John Stott, a commentator on the Bible, Anglican priest, he says this, uh, I could never myself believe in God if it were not for the incarnation. In the real world of pain, how could one worship a God who was immune to it? In the real world of pain, how could one worship a God who was immune to it? We, have, we worship the God who did not stay away from suffering. That's the first thing. Now, it doesn't solve the problem that we experience of the real world of pain, does it? But it does tell us one thing. It tells us God is not this detached uh, kind of willing but un, una, or unable to do anything about it. He's not detached. He enters in and he won't stay distant. The second thing is in verses 1 to 5, we see a God who, alongside refusing to stay away, refuses to look away from injustice. Have a look at verses 1 and 5. Verse 1. See, I'm going to send my messenger. And then verse 5. I'm coming to you in judgment. And I'll be ready to witness against sorcerers, adulterers, those who swear falsely, those who oppress the hired worker, the widow, the fatherless, those who deny justice to the resident, and so on and so on. It's those who have broken the law, broken the covenant. The point is, God is going to come in judgment. God will not look away from injustice. It will not go on forever. And so the point is, I suppose, uh, you know, are there times when you might say, is this right, God, where you're angry, like genuinely angry? And it's true, you shake your fist and you might say, how could the world, how could this happen? God is even more angry, righteously angry at injustice. He will execute justice and he will not let people get away. There is a day where he will do right every wrong and he will execute justice. We will call this the God of wrath. And when we hear that, perhaps as Western people, it makes us feel a bit squeamish and think God is a bit, I feel it feels like he's a bit primitive and it feels a bit narrow minded. And perhaps we might even say, I don't want to believe in a God or I don't like to believe in a God of, I like to believe in a God of love. Meaning, I don't believe in a God that punishes or I don't want to believe in a God that punishes. Verse 1, the messenger is coming or the Lord is coming. Verse 5, he will execute justice to all those who have broken the covenant to all but look at verse 2 who can stand who can endure the coming of the Lord the issue is of course the implied answer to that is none the issue is that all have broken the covenant and why I'm saying the issue it is is because it's an issue for us because remember earlier I said, we, at the very start I said, we cannot believe in a God who does nothing in the face of injustice. I can't believe in a God who does nothing. And yet, I can't believe in a God who would be wrathful and punishing. This is what Western people hold together often. I can't believe in a God who would allow evil to happen, but then I, I don't want a God that is filled with wrath, that he could punish people. How do those two stand? <laughs> they don't stand together. They don't stand together, do they? And this is because it's the blindness that's in our hearts. We can't see our own sin. Because really, when it gets down to it, what we really want is we want justice for every evil that is done for others but we want mercy for the things that we've done. 
And I know I've said this one before, but it's a really good one. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, you know, he says, um, he says, if we could only just get everyone who is evil and just corral them over here and get rid of them, and then that would be great. But he says, the problem of evil, of course, runs, the dividing line of evil runs through the heart of every human being. And this is what it's saying here in verse 2. It's saying, who can stand? Who is able to endure? We can't see our own sin. We're blind. We, that's why we can hold those two things together in our hearts. That's why we can say, I can't believe in a God who, who does nothing in the face of it. And I can't believe in a God who would punish. I don't know. We, that's why we can hold them together. And you know what the wrath of God is? The best definition I've heard is the wrath of God. The wrath of God, it's not his irritability. It's the wrath of God is the love of God. It's connected to the love of God in friction with injustice. The wrath of God is the love of God in friction with injustice. So we have a God who we worship who refuses to stay away, number one, refuses to stay away. Number two, he refuses to look away. And how wonderful it is at Christmas we know that we have a God who also refuses to wipe us away. Because how is this God going to end suffering without ending you and me? Who have taken part, part of the law breaking, part of the covenant breaking, we worship a God who will not wipe us away. Have a look at verse 2, chapter 3. He says there, it's a refiner's fire. I'm refining a fire. And he says, uh, I'm a laundering, launderer's soap. A refining fire doesn't destroy, does it? In the end, it, it purifies. And the launderer's soap, it's an agent that doesn't destroy, but it cleanses. And in Jesus' day, not Jesus' day, sorry, in Malachi's day, 300 years before, during this prophecy, everyone was expecting a day of power and a day of justice, a day when God would bring perfect justice. And everyone was saying, yes, all the lawbreakers, all those people will deserve it, but none of them wanted it for themselves. But what happens when God actually turns up? In, at Christmas, what happens? He doesn't come in power, does he? Riding on, a, riding on clouds of lightning with wings, but he comes born in a manger. He comes in weakness. He comes to enter into our evil and to defeat it from the inside out. He comes to take on flesh. Why? So that he could be a God who is both just and merciful at the same time. He says, I won't stay away from yourself. I'll get involved. I won't look away but I won't wipe you away. And so the Christmas story, of course, ends up on the cross and we see him hanging there on the cross. And that's where we say, that is my judgment day. That is your judgment day. He opens the way for the possibility of redemption, dies in weakness, laying down his life so that he can justly show us mercy. And we didn't read out uh, verse 16 in chapter 3, but just look at that, verse 16. Have a look. It says there, chapter 3, verse 16, on that day, it's the same day, the day when the Lord will come, the day of judgment, the day of mercy, on that day, at that time, those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. Uh, here it is, verse 18. So, sorry, verse 17. They will be mine, says the Lord of armies, my own possession on the day I'm preparing. I will have compassion on them as a man has compassion on his son he ser who serves him. So you will again see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. There will be a time God will right every wrong and he's having compassion on people and there'll be a time when, when people will serve him. People who are part of his covenant. He's talking, of course, about people who will turn to Jesus. In one sense, the righteous and wicked are seen in their response to the God who has done it all, who said, I won't stay away from evil. I've come, I won't look away, and I won't wipe you away. It's the one who has done it all on the cross already. 
and our response to him is our faith and our covenant keeping and it's how we are known by him. And so there is a righting of the wrongs. It's not that the evil will always get away. It's that God has dealt with it and he will deal with it finally and fully when he comes again. Christmas is God's response to suffering because it shows us he's a God who refuses to stay away, refuses to look away, and he refuses to wipe us away. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we read of that, those words, who can endure the day of the Lord? And we, we rightly tremble and we hear of who can stand. And we do see evil around us. And yet we thank you for those words that speak of compassion and of mercy. And that you will turn away because on the cross, your son bore the judgment that we deserve. The wrath was, of God was sent on him and he's opened the way for forgiveness and for life and for redemption. And this morning, help us, if we're struggling with the idea of suffering with evil, help us to grasp how fully you have taken care of it. And help us to lay our fights, our bitterness, our resentment on your feet and lay them at, your, at the foot of your crown and your kingly, kingly rule. Help us mercifully to accept your grace and to listen to you and to be people who say thank you for the great uh, forgiveness we have in Christ. Help us to see the cross more and to see your justice and your mercy and help us to worship at your feet this morning, we pray. Amen.